Hey, hallelujah. I want to welcome everybody tuning in on the internet. Sorry, I just got started and didn't say hi to you. Welcome to the vineyard. Um, this teaching is on the true timing for Yeshua's birth. And, um, and so there's a stirring going on right now among Christians. Y'all know the Kirk Cameron movies out there. You know all this stuff going on. And um, many, many people that aren't even in Hebrew Roots congregations, I mean, they're still going to church on Sunday and, and whatever, they are beginning to wake up to the fact that there's some issues with Christmas. And, and even if you want to say, okay, look, I'm just going to, you know, uh, I'm going to celebrate it. I heard a testimony last night of a man who, who read Jeremiah 10 and he saw, okay, this is clearly a Christmas tree and I shouldn't have it in my house. For those of you that don't know, Jeremiah 10 says, don't do like the heathen, don't, don't, don't go into the forest and cut down a green tree. It says, don't bring it into your house, deck it with silver and gold. Clearly Christmas trees have been around way before Jesus was born. Amen? And let's all go ahead and turn our phones off or put them on silent. Um, and so, um, this man said when he first started coming out of the Christmas trappings, he said he realized the tree was bad, so what he did is he put a, a, little, um, a little feeding trough, and he put a blanket, and he put a little a fake baby Jesus in there. And he said, well, we're still doing Christmas, but we're going to put the presents around this little baby Jesus. And he said it was so crazy. He said, we laid the presents down, and then we took them right back on Christmas Day. And he said it was the silliest thing he ever did. And then, you know, a year or two later, he quit doing Christmas totally. Okay, so it is a process to, to uh, come out of that, those traditions. Um, but um, you read about um, Hanukkah in the book mostly in the book of 2 Maccabees. So you hear the story of what happened, and last week we learned the history of Hanukkah and how that it's all over the Bible. It's in the book of Daniel. You can hear the leading up to it with Ezra and Nehemiah, even in Chronicles. And then, um, um, but to really read the story, you need to go to 2 Maccabees. And this is what I'm just going to skim over a little bit of just for a minute to show you historically that Hanukkah is not just some Jewish Christmas fairy tale holiday. It is the Feast of Tabernacles celebrated in the winter. That's exactly what it is. So in 2 Maccabees, uh, around 8, it says, We were seeking the Lord, and we heard... Him, and we offered sacrifices, and we offered a meal offering, and we lit the lamps, which is the menorah, and we presented the loaves. So what they did, remember, there was a great battle, and, and uh, Antiochus' army was in the land, and the guerrilla warfare militia of the Jewish people, they drove the army out, then they went into the temple, and they set everything up in the temple, they put the big menorah back up, and they lit it, and they started the sacrifices again. And here's the, this is, then they wrote a letter and they distributed it throughout all of the land. And it said, um, we are writing to you, brothers and sisters in Jerusalem, and we're encouraging you to keep the Feast of Tabernacles in the month of Kislev. That's this month. And they said, um, Later, they said, um, we are about to... This is a letter written to everyone. We are about to celebrate the purification of the temple, and on the 25th day of the month of Kislev, we think it necessary to inform you that you also may observe the festival of tabernacles and the kindling of the fire when Nehemiah, who built the temple and the altar, offered the sacrifices. And several places in 2 Maccabees... Um, Again, in, in, uh, in um, chapter 2.16, we are about to celebrate the purification of the temple, so we write to you, please ob observe these days, because it is God who saved His people and brought them back and gave them their heritage, their kingdom and their priesthood and the consecration that He promised through the law. 
And He has delivered us from all our misfortunes. And so um, if you read, all you have to do is read this historical account of what happened and you will know why do we celebrate Hanukkah. We celebrate Hanukkah because the whole story is a story about the temple being defiled and then God's people getting victory and rededicating the temple to God. So, I read to you out of 2 Maccabees. The reason I did that is because I wanted you to know that Hanukkah is eight days long. How long is the Feast of Tabernacles? And Hanukkah is not just some holiday made up in the winter. It's the Feast of Tabernacles in the winter. Okay? That's the important connection there. Isaac is a type or what is called a shadow of Yeshua. What is he? A type and a shadow. Those words are important, especially the word shadow as we move on through this teaching. So we're going to look at the shadow prophecy of Isaac's birth. Isaac was born, hear me, just right up front I'm going to tell you, Isaac was born during the Feast of Tabernacles. We're going to look at the Scripture and I'm going to show you that. And his birth is a shadow picture of Yeshua's birth. We will find similarities in Yeshua's birth and Isaac's birth and when Mary conceived and when Sarah conceived. Okay? Who's Isaac's mom? Sarah. Who's Yeshua's mom? Mary. So we're going to see these really cool similarities that are not random. They're, they're to teach us. So if you study... You can study the writings of the, what they call the sages and the rabbis of Judaism. And they teach, listen, they teach that Isaac was born on a feast. There's no question in the minds of the rabbis that Isaac was born on a feast. The debate exists. Here's what's funny. We have this impression that all the rabbis always agree and they have this one set of doctrine. They don't. They're just as divided as Christianity. There are sects, even within the Orthodox community, there's sects, all kinds of sects of Judaism. So the rabbis teach, yes, Yeshua was born during a feast, but there's three opinions, there's three main feasts. Was it Passover, Pentecost, or the Feast of Tabernacles that Isaac was born on? So my theory I've already laid out for you, that I think it's the Feast of Tabernacles. If Isaac is a shadow picture of the Messiah, then the feast, I believe Scripture teaches us he was born during the Feast of Tabernacles in, in Hebrew. It's called Sukkot. Now listen, Isaac was the child of promise. Do you remember? Was he promised? And then it was just an amazing thing when Abraham had to take the promised one. And again, that picture of Yeshua going up the mountain. And it says that Abraham took his son Isaac and he called him a lad. The Hebrew word lad is not little boy. It's a 30-year-old man. He wasn't walking his little son up the mountain. He was walking his grown son, same age as Yeshua, up the mountain. And when Abraham went to kill him, he didn't pull a knife back like this because he had to kosher kill him. He put the knife to his throat while Isaac was laying down. It was going to be just slit his throat and let him die. He wouldn't have, he wouldn't have stabbed his son like a murder movie. We got these pictures in our mind. Isaac is the child of promise and so is Yeshua. And listen, this is fascinating. Yahweh took great interest in describing the birth of Isaac. More is said about Isaac's birth before he was born more was said about him than any other person in the Scripture except for Yeshua. Genesis 17. Then God said to Abraham, As for Sarai your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her and also give you a son, a son by her. Then I will bless her, and she will be the mother of nations. Kings and peoples shall be from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and bowed down, and he laughed as he thought in his heart, Shall a child be born to a man 
that's a hundred years old. Seriously? Listen, Sarah gets a bad rap because everybody says, why did she laugh? You know who laughed first? Her husband. But he wasn't like, he wasn't like falling down, chuckling his belly. The scripture says he fell down and worshipped. And in his, cell, in his heart, he was like, oh, I he was like, you know, you laugh to yourself sometimes when you're not supposed to, and he was like, just because it says he's thinking this in his head, it's like, like, really? Now, he's doubting this is going to happen. Remember Zechariah? When the angel came to him? Did he believe right away? He's like, listen, my wife is so old. And he's like, you can't talk. <laughs> He has to write. <coughs> he cannot talk until he gives the son's name. Yohanan. I can talk. How oh, hallelujah. Nine months he can't talk. So there's these similarities all through the scriptures. So he's hardly, it's like having a hard time believing this. Why? He's an old man, his wife's old. I mean, it's just a no normal thing. The womb stops putting out uh, the eggs and the, and the body changes. All this stuff happening. A woman is born with X amount of eggs. And shall Sarah, who is 90 year old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, so he's concerned about his firstborn, his real firstborn. Oh, Lord, just bless Ishmael. He said, No, Sarah, your wife's going to give you a son. You shall call his name Yitzhak. Yitzhak. Which um, is a very deep name. It doesn't just mean laughter. Um, but it does. It means to laugh or he will laugh. But it's, it, that's a whole other teaching. And I will establish... Now listen. We're, th we're looking at Isaac as a picture of Yeshua, right? And he says, I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant. Who else has an everlasting covenant? Yeshua. Jesus and with his descendants. This miracle, now listen, Sarah's old, her womb is dead, there's nothing in there. Some rabbis even teach that at that point, she just had, she had no womb at all. I don't know what that's even possible, but there was something wrong inside of her where she couldn't have a son. Till a miracle happened. So we have, with Mary, we have a virgin womb with with, um, with Sarah, we have a dead womb. They are the opposite, but they're both supernatural. Do you understand that? You see the picture. You got a miracle either way. God quickened. Now, this is a man I just started reading about, A.W. Pink. You heard of him? I knew you would have. He's got some, he's teaching stuff, man. Yes, 25 days and nights to commemorate. Eight days and nights, Hanukkah. What was it over there? We got a new teaching coming up soon. Here, we got a robot that's going to take over. Come on up. <laughs> beep, beep, beep. I've been outsourced by iPhone 12. A.W. Pink said this, If God quickened a dead womb and caused it to bear, why should it be thought a thing incredible if He made the virgin give birth? Right? Talking about all this stuff. Oh, it's cool stuff God showed me. Amen. Um, in Genesis 17... But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom... Sh now, this is, this is where this story starts to get really deep. Now, pay attention. Okay? My covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you. What's that next... Uh, at this set time next year. Now, set time in Hebrew is the word moed. Everybody say moed. Moed... moed normally is translated as feast. It's the word feast. So moed is feast. What's moed? What is set time here? Feast. 
This is what's amazing. Retranslated, this says, My covenant I will establish to you through with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you. Read that with me. At this feast next year. That's literally what the Hebrew says. Yahweh says, at this feast next year. Isn't that interesting? So what feast would it be? Then Yahweh appeared to him by the terebinth trees of Mamre as he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. Where was he sitting? In a tent. Sukkot is the feast of booths or what do we camp in? So when Yahweh appears and begins dealing with him, he's sitting in a tent. Right? Now this is from the Babylon helmet on Rosh Hashanah in chapter about Rosh Hashanah 11a. Here's what it says. This is not Matthew. This is Orthodox Judaism teaching which gives us hints to learn about these things. Reading set time... So this is not just me making this up. Reading set time in Genesis 18.14 to mean the next holy day or the feast, as in Leviticus 23, the Gemara deduced that God spoke to Abraham when? On Sukkot! The Jewish people say... God came to Abraham during the Feast of Tabernacles, and what did He say? Because He's during a feast, He says, at this feast, next year, I'm going to come back, and she's going to have a son. That's something. Listen, if you don't have your Hebrew lenses on, you can't get this from the Scripture. And preachers, 99% of them, if they go to the Old Testament, it's just fun stories. There's nothing for today. There's no applications. Yeah, that's right, so you have to know Hebrew to get into this stuff. Sukkot is the feast of booths or tent. Abraham was in a tent. In Genesis 18.14, Yahweh saying, Is anything too hard for Yahweh? At the appointed time, at the Moed, at the feast, I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah will have a son. Yahweh came to Abraham during a feast. Yahweh said He would have a son at this next feast next year. Abraham was in a tent when this happened. And He says, I will return to you. In Genesis 21, there's no mention. Check this out. Yahweh says, I'm going to come back next year during this feast. Nowhere in the Scripture do we see Yahweh coming back. Nowhere. The way He comes back is through this miracle birth, which is also again a picture of Yeshua that we see. There's no mention of Yahweh returning to Abraham other than returning through the promise of a son named Isaac. So Isaac is this. Remember we're building a case that Isaac is a picture of Yeshua. Isaac is the covenant son of promise that Yahweh returns through. Isn't that deep? Oh, y'all didn't get it. Some of you did. It went up. It's like, shh. That'll sink in in a minute. Even the rabbis teach that he's a picture of the Messiah. I will return to you just like Isaac. Yeshua is the covenant son of promise that Yahweh returns through. Think about it. Yahweh in the flesh is named Yeshua. <coughs> Romans 9 says, For they are not all Israel who are of Israel, nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac your seed shall be called that is, those who are the children of flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. For this is the word of promise. And this is in the New Testament. At this set time, at this feast, I will come and Sarah will have a son. Romans 9 says that Isaac is a shadow of Yeshua. And he says, in Isaac the seed will be called, and he says, and... During the Feast of Tabernacles, Sarah will have a covenant son of promise. All a picture pointing to Yeshua. Galatians says, Now to Abraham and his seed where the promise is made, and it does not say, And to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed who is the Messiah. Now listen, he's talking about Isaac. 
you got to just get this deep stuff, man. He's talking about this picture of Isaac to you, in your seed and all these things, but the reality was it was about Yeshua. It was about Isaac and it was about Yeshua. The ultimate is it's about Yeshua. They're covenant sons of promise. But Paul brings it out and he says, listen, this is really about Yeshua. That's what Paul did. Paul took these things that Judaism was teaching and he showed how they were about Yeshua. And the rabbis that were still orthodox and didn't believe in Yeshua, they hated Him and they even said in the book of Acts that He was teaching people not to keep the Sabbath and the feast. And Paul clearly says, I'm not doing that. You can read the story when Paul was getting accused of teaching against the Torah. And he says, that's not what I'm doing. And he took a vow, and the Bible says he took a vow specifically to prove he still follows the law and teaches people to follow the law. And Galatians says, if you're Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So Isaac is a shadow of Yeshua. In the Torah, Isaac is called the seed. This was pointing to the new covenant where Yeshua is the seed. You see the connections? Fascinating. And that's just that phrase again. So now, here's the question that you may be thinking, or maybe you're on the internet and you're watching this and you're like, come on, man. The feasts weren't given until Moses. So how's Abraham keeping a feast? Think about it. When were the feasts given? Most of us don't know this. Most of us think that the feasts were given on Mount Sinai, right? 99% of people. Preachers and Christians and your people, they think the feasts were given on Mount Sinai. The feasts were created before humans. They were embedded in the solar system. And Adam kept the feast. All the people kept the feast. They really did. You can go through the Scriptures. I'm working on a teaching where I'm going to show feasts in the Old Testament before Moses. It's all over the place. So the feasts weren't given until the time of Moses, right? The answer to that is no. The feasts were created in Genesis 1. So when were the feasts created? When? The feast days were created before humans. Genesis 1.13, And evening and morning were the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the firm of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and what? and days and years, and let them be for lights in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth. Listen to this. The first reason that God put the stars and the moon and all that stuff in the heaven was not for lights. That's secondary. No, that's what the Scripture says. It doesn't say God put the stars and all that up there to give light, and oh, by the way, they're going to tell you when the feasts are. It says the first reason that the moon and the stars, and the stars, Jerry, right Jerry? Right. And the stars, we're studying that one. Those things, they're up there for, um, for, for, for the feast. So that word seasons is feasts. It's the same word that we read about in Genesis when he said, I come at the set time. He says, I come at the feast. All the patriarchs knew about Yahweh's set times or Yahweh's feasts. Why? Because when God made the world, He made it for people to worship Him. He made humans. We are here to worship Him. And so there were set times to worship Him. Now, well, here's what happened. When the children of Israel were slaved all those years, they couldn't keep the Sabbath. They couldn't use Yahweh's name. Their diet, all that stuff was restricted just like we are over here in East Tennessee. And then... They forgot all those years. That's why Yahweh brings them to the mountain. He doesn't say, here's a new thing called the Sabbath. What does He say? Remember. Amen. You already knew it. Your ancestors knew it. Now it's time to remember. Right, bro. That's what He says to us. Remember the Sabbath. And then what does He do? He says, these feasts, He gets to reteach them. But what He does is He gives new insight pointing to the Messiah, and He adds to the feast that they already knew, a sacrificial system and a priesthood and all these things in a temple. See, before that, they were still a kingdom of priests. They really were.
Now listen to this. Yahweh, in Genesis 21, and Yahweh visited, say visited, visited. Sarah as he said, and Yahweh did for Sarah as he had spoken. Now this word visited in Hebrew is pachad. Say pachad. Means oversight, oversee, or to? Overshadow. Now listen, Sarah's Mary. Picture of Mary. And what does it say? Yahweh came and overshadowed her. What's that remind you of? Mary. It's the same word. And the angel answered and said to her, Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will what? Pakad. Come and overshadow you. See the connections? Now, Isaac is a shadow of Yeshua. The angel overshadowed Sarah and the angel overshadowed Mary. And in Corinthians it says this, Let no one judge you in food or drink or regards to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is Christ. People will twist that scripture. If you start keeping the feast, all of a sudden they're going to say, those are just shadows. They're just shadows. The substance is Christ. You know what you say? Amen, they're just shadows. You, cannot you can't deny what Paul says. Of course they're shadows. But the Bible says, he that dwells under the wing of the Almighty shall abide in the shadow of the Most High. Yeah. Right. The shadow is where you want to be. The shadow is where you want to be. That means you're in sync with Him. That's true. That's true. If you're walking right beside the Messiah, you need to be in His shadow. <laughs> Listen. Listen. Here's Matthew. That's my shadow. That's the only way that somebody that don't know Matthew's here will be able to see what I look like. If you can't see Matthew, but you can see a shadow, that's how you know what I look like. Is Yeshua visible? Well, not to us right now. He's in us, each and every one. He's visible in the heavenlies. And one day He will come and we will get to touch Him and hold Him. And I'm going to snuggle in His beard like I did at you on Sukkot. I'm going to get right up in that beard, man. I've been practicing on you. <laughs> Imagine when you look in His eyes. Your whole life's going to be in those eyes. Love. The feasts are shadows. Now that's a picture of Yeshua. That's a shadow of Yeshua, right? Every feast is in here. Sabbath, Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, Pentecost, trumpets, atonement, and tabernacles make up this shadow. It's the only way on earth we can see what the Messiah looks like. When Christians keep the feast, we show the image of Christ to the world. That's what it means when He's a shadow. It's not a bad thing. It does not mean you don't have to do the feasts. It means you do them and you show what He looks like. That's what it means. Now, if Yeshua gives us this image, what do you think Christmas and Easter give us? Serious. All pagan holidays are shadows of a demon that influenced a man or a fallen angel that influenced a man to create a holiday to trick God's people and the rest of the world. And when you keep those days, the image you create is a demonic mixture. That's why we come out of her, my people. Amen. We should not continue to preach the gospel of Yeshua mixed with lies. Yes. Yes. 
When the three men, when it wasn't even three men, when the wise men came, they didn't come to the manger. They didn't come to the sukkah. It was two years later. They came to a house. Little baby Jesus was walking around by then. The whole thing is a mixture of lies. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High will abide in the shadows. And the feasts are shadows. Th listen, that's the only way this scripture comes to pass, Christians. You can't just get in His shadow any other way unless you're keeping the feast. I don't care what my Christian brothers and sisters say about this passage. It's referring to keeping the feast days. You have to let Scripture interpret Scripture. So the feast are shadows, and when Shara was overshadowed, she gave birth to the covenant son of promise called Isaac. This was a shadow feast prophecy pointing to Mary being overshadowed and giving birth to the covenant son of promise, Yeshua, who's also called the seed. Wow, we went through one of the five so far. Hallelujah. Feast on the word of Yahweh. I tell you what, my daughter, she did ask me last night if I was a chef. And now I say, yes, I cook up meals every Sabbath for my people, for Yahweh's people to eat. And you will not go hungry. There's 17 courses. Just keep on eating. We're just getting started over there, Tim. We just got started. This is just the beginning. <laughs> so number two is Zechariah's father, or Zechariah, who's John's father. Now what we're going to look at, so far we just looked at Isaac. Now we're going to look at Zechariah, because we've got to connect. Now we see that um, Isaac's a picture of Yeshua. He was born on Feast of Tabernacles, right? And then all the other stuff with the shadows and all that. So now what we're going to do is we're going to look at Zechariah, who's John the Baptist's dad. And why are we doing this? Because I'm proving to you when Yeshua is truly born. It's math. We're going to just do simple math here in a little bit and prove it. In Luke 1, it says this, There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judah, a certain priest named Zechariah, or Zacharias, of the division of Abijah, or Abiyah. Okay? My father is Yah in Hebrew. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elisheva or Elizabeth. Now, the key to this, the key to understanding when Yeshua was born, as we begin to do math, is found right here because it says that Zechariah was of the course of the priests in the line of Abijah. Okay? What does that mean? Why is that in there? It's a hint. There are 24 courses of priests. The priests work two weeks a year in courses, 48 weeks, and then they worked three weeks. All the priests worked together. Okay? So there was 12 and 12 sets. Okay? 40, there was a total of 24 courses. And um, they would take two weeks. And if your course was up during the two weeks, there would be a lot chosen to who was going to be the high priest and who was going to go in and do the, the, the special stuff. Okay? And so we know from history, we can just study this, that the course of Abijah was in early or mid-June. So when was it? Alright. Now we're going to look at Elizabeth's getting pregnant, pregnant her pregnancy. So we know that Zechariah is in the temple on the pagan calendar, on the Gregorian calendar, earlier mid-June. Right? All right. And Luke says this, So as soon as the days of his service were completed, he departed to his own house. So let me tell you what happened. He's in there. Zechariah is in the temple. And the angel comes and says, You're going to have a son. And he's like, no, I'm not. Come on. Who, who, who in 
their right mind talks to an angel, when you're in the, the temple as a priest doing some whatever, doing the wicks or whatever, I can't remember what he's doing, and you're going to talk back to an angel. But we can't judge him. It's hard to believe some stuff that God does. You even have prayed for stuff, and then when He does it, you're like, I can't even hardly believe He did that for me. And you already saw it done and you can't even believe it. Yeah, this guy was just getting the word of promise. So he comes out and he can't talk. And listen to what the Scripture says. As soon as. Say as soon as. as, soon as. That means real fast like. The days of his service were completed. He departed to his own house. And then it says after those days. That means real quick. His wife conceived. Now why? Why was he in such a hurry? He can't talk. He actually has to go home and do something about this. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Woman, he can't talk. <laughs> That's what happened. He wanted to get this. We got to start. <laughs> And then quickly, she's conceived. Why? It's a promise. God's doing something. So he can't speak. He realizes he better help him try to have a baby real quick. Right? That's just the reality of what's going on. And then it says, later on that past, so it was as soon as the days of his service were completed, he departed to his own house. After those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived. She hid herself five months how long did she hide? The Lord has dealt with me in the days He looked upon me to take away my reproach. So near the middle of June, earlier mid-June, earlier mid-June, he can't talk. He gets home. So near the end, the middle or end of June, he's home and he's got his wife pregnant. Right? So just look at this. He's got two weeks. It says, real quick it happened. She's pregnant near the end of June. Everybody understand how I'm getting that conclusion? So you go from June and you add nine months. She goes the term of the baby. Brings you to March or April. When does it bring you to? March or April. This puts John the Baptist's birth during Passover. When did John the Baptist get born? Passover. How cool is that? The Bible says that He came in the spirit of... And every year at Passover, we set out an extra plate for who? Because one day Elijah is going to show up at Passover. It's a tradition. The Jewish people have been waiting on Elijah at Passover. And this year, the one that came in the spirit of Elijah was born during Passover. It's not a coincidence. So Elizabeth got pregnant end of June. Nine months since April, March, Passover, the, John the Baptist is born. Now we're going to look at Mary and we're going to connect the dots. Now in the sixth month, what month? This is where my Messianic rabbis go wrong. You just have to keep reading, guys. It tells you what the sixth month is. Well, they say right there, it's the sixth month. I mean, I've, I've sat down. I mean, the rabbi that trained me has this wrong. Because it says the sixth month, but I'm going to show you what's connecting this to. And, and a lot of people believe this is the sixth month starting from Passover. Okay? Which just has you... It ends up Yeshua being born on some non-date in the middle of a calendar that doesn't make any sense. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man who was named Joseph of the house of David. The virgin was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Yeshua. Now look. If you read here, 26 through 28 says the sixth month. 
31 saying that she's going to have a son. And then 36 tells us, connects this sixth month. See the sixth month? We are told later what this sixth month is. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has conceived a son in her old age and is now in the sixth month for her that was called barren. So the Scripture says she hid herself how many months? Now in the sixth month she's revealed. And you read all this in context. It says Elizabeth hid herself five months. And then it says in the sixth month the angel came to Mary. In the sixth month of what? Elizabeth's pregnancy. This is a timeline. You have to start. It says she was pregnant and she was hid for five months. The very next sentence, in the sixth month. Not the sixth month brand new of the year. In context, the sixth month. She was hid in fifth month. Five months. In the sixth month, Mary's pregnant. And then the angel actually says, listen, she's in her sixth month. You understand how we get this? Yeah. All right. So in early June, Zechariah's in the temple. Elizabeth is overshadowed in late June and come pregnant with John. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, Mary gets pregnant. Do you understand that so far? Yeah. You understand? In June, late end of June, Elizabeth is pregnant. In the sixth month, the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, Mary's pregnant. Alright? So we count from June and we add six months. It has Mary being overshadowed in what month? December. December. Everybody understand? From June... Six months takes you to Kislev or December. If it's at the end, you're getting right into December. And Mary gets overshadowed in December. Now, is it just some random thing that Mary gets overshadowed in December? No. During December is Hanukkah called the festival of... Yeshua, who is the light of the world, is conceived in the Virgin Mary during the festival of lights. Do you see how all the math just adds up? When you look at it. And Hanukkah is the Feast of Tabernacles in the winter, and both are eight days long. It's amazing. Yeshua was conceived in December during the Festival of Lights. Hanukkah, also known as the Feast of Tabernacles in the winter. And if we add nine months to December, we come to September. Right? The Feast of Tabernacles is either in September or October, depending on God and when the, the moons are. And it alternates from one year. It's in September. Next year it will be in October, most of the time. And we can actually look at the math. We can look at the stars and find out. And I cut this part of the teaching out. Okay? But I've got a whole section of this. If you find the teaching that we did two years ago when I go through the, the gospel in the stars. And you can actually look up in the stars. And you can see when the virgin Virgo... is um, clothed with the sun and the moon and the stars under her feet. The sun, you look up the constellation, you can see the sun going into the belly of the virgin. The sun in the belly of the virgin and stars under her feet. And all that happens right, right at the beginning of, uh, right before Sukkot. And it only happened in this one year. You know what year it was? The year Yeshua was born. The Bible tells us that God wrote the gospel in the stars. And Satan has messed with even the constellations because the constellations originally were to preach the gospel. There's a lion, a virgin, you know, all those things. Satan made horoscopes. But the reality is there is something to that stuff. Don't go looking into it, but there are similarities. You find somebody that's born on the same day as you around the same year. You're going to have common interests. You're going to link with people like that. There's some spiritual things we can't get into. It. Those are things God says are hidden, not to inquire of. So Yeshua was born in 3, the year 3 B.C., 
on the Feast of Tabernacles, and it actually fell in September that year, so all the math actually adds up. So Yeshua was born during the Feast of Tabernacles. And it says this in John, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him. Without Him, nothing was made that was made in Him was life, and that life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness. See all these pictures of light and all these things? And the darkness didn't com comprehend it. Hanukkah is the festival of lights. And it says the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And that word dwelt is the Greek word that is translated as pitch a tent or build a sukkah or tabernacle. So when it says that the Word became flesh and dwelt, it's actually, you can say, the Word became flesh and tabernacled among us. And that's how it should be translated you think that's just a random word? No, it tells us Yeshua tabernacled. Now the sukkah and manger connection. First thing I want to say is this. When it says little baby Jesus was born in a, a, a manger, the manger is not this little thing here. I always thought, come on. Did you not always think that the manger was that little thing? That's right. That's not what the manger is. There's a, now, come on. You know what we do at Sukkot? We put out our manger scene. We put, I was going to throw those things away. I kept them. You know what I do with them? Put them out during Sukkot. Now, I've just got one, yeah, I've got one that don't have three wise men. But I've got a manger scene I put out at Sukkot. And I'm looking to buy a big yard one. And it's going to say, this is when Jesus, Jesus was born during time. I don't know what it's going to say yet, but it's going to say something. <laughs> and it's going to say something, and my neighbors are going to wonder. And I'll probably need to put our email address or website or something oh, on there. God. For more information, call Tom Campbell. <laughs> Get ready. <laughs> I'm giving you a year. <laughs> <laughs> he would love to talk to you. <laughs> so y'all have seen these, right? This is called a manger scene, right? Now, I'm going to show you some. Here's another one, manger scene. And there's one made of tall paper rolls. But, that's a sukkah. These are mangers. That's a sukkah. That's a sukkah. That's a sukkah. We, have, we build that when we have the Feast of Tabernacles. You come to our banquet, we build one of those. Why? That's what the Bible says. You build a three-sided thing. You put branches on top. And that's where you camp out and you have your meals and stuff. Technically, we, we, we build one of those, but then we just camp in our tents. But we, we have one of those... Um, so, the manger Yeshua was laid in was not the cradle, but the stall. It's a three-sided tabernacle that was set up for this feast. So it was while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered, and she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger. Now, my daughter Eliana is memorizing this for school. She's in the Providence Academy. She goes to a private Christian school, and they do Christmas. So when she memorized this, I make her say manger, and she has to say, which is a sukkah. And they, who knows what they think of that? doesn't matter. Because there was no room for them in the inn. Now according to rabbinic tradition, the women... Okay. Oh man, that would take a while to explain. The women didn't have to actually camp in the tent. Just the men were required to by Jewish law, not by Torah, but by Jewish law, which is there's a difference. So the reason the inns were packed full of people is because all the women and children were staying in the inns and the men were on the street in their sukkahs. You understand? Yeah. And all the women had packed out all the motels and hotels. And in Luke, we see this same exact word for manger translated as stall. The Lord answered him and said, Hypocrite, does each one of you on the Sabbath loose his donkey from the stall and lead it away into water? 
And, I, and there's a whole teaching. Like you take this word manger, you look it up in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew text, and you find out the Hebrew equivalent, and it equals the sukkah. And so there's a stall. You see the connection? Horse stall, sukkah. They're actually the same words because you would build a very similar things to keep your animals in. And the men would build them for the Feast of Tabernacles. And that's why people think that little baby Jesus had the cow and the donkey and the pig in there. There ain't none of that stuff in the story. There ain't no animals like slobbering on Him looking over at Him. I mean, it's silly, the stuff we add to the story. <coughs> now listen, I'm going to show you this same word. Here it is. Jacob journeyed from Sukkot, built here for him a house, and booths Sukkot for his livestock. Do you understand that you can build a sukkah for the Feast of Tabernacles, and you can also build one and put your animals in it. Why? They're the exact same thing. Just a littler one when you camp in it. Does that make sense? You understand? So the Hebraic understanding of the Greek word stall or manger is sukkah. So a, a sukkah, a, a tabernacle, can be for this feast, for sleeping in, or it can be to put your animals in. Does that make sense? So all the evidence... And I didn't even put the gospel in the stars and all that stuff in here. All of the evidence suggests to us what? Jesus or Yeshua was born during the Feast of Tabernacles. Is that conclusive enough? To, for me it is. When I found all this stuff out, it made so much sense. So listen, do you want to celebrate the birth of Yeshua? It's a great thing to do. Just do it at the right time of year. There's a new document found. And you can go on First Fruits of Zion's website. And so, you know, the Bible doesn't... There's no single sentence or phrase... We're going to be right over to get the food here in a minute. There's no... Sing, they're going to get us ready. There's no phrase. I can't take you to anywhere in the Bible that says Jesus was born on Feast Tabernacles. You can't do it. You've got to dig for some things like there's a treasure involved. So what we did is we went from Genesis all the way through the Bible to prove all this stuff. Okay? But there's an ancient document found dated to the first century. And it was written by Jewish people that didn't believe in Yeshua. And they were writing to other Jewish people. So it was like the rabbis of, of the apostles' day were writing a document to the Jewish people to warn them against the Messianic Jews. Do you understand so far what this book that they just found? It's a book of warning written by the Orthodox rabbis of the days of the apostles to warn the other Jewish people about Messianic Jews. And it says, here's how you will identify them. They will be keeping Passover, but they will be saying that their Jesus, Yeshua, is when He was sacrificed. They will be celebrating um, Pentecost and be saying that this is when the Holy Spirit came. And they said they will be celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles and be saying that that's when their Messiah was born. So there's evidence. This is not just some fairy tale that Yeshua was born now during the Feast of Tabernacles. There's evidence from the first century days of the Apostles anti-missionaries writing and saying even in that day they were equating Yeshua's birth to the Feast of Tabernacles. Isn't that interesting? So when was He born? We know! Feast of Tabernacles. Amen? Let's close. Yahweh's work in His vineyard Grafting the wild branch in Oh, what a joyous occasion To be counted worthy of Him Lift up your hands and praise Him Lift up your voice and praise Him